Right, I'm sorry. The next main event we've got next week is embarrassing. This one here, prelim worthy. The one next week, early prelims. Right, Evan Elder versus Darius Flowers. And for me, I've gone with Evan Elder. I've put it there already because Darius Flowers to me is a passion merchant. All he does is get really excited and kind of like to show off. And against Michael Johnson, Michael Johnson out grappled. For me, that was embarrassing. Yeah, Michael Johnson's grappled back in the day. But when do you ever see Michael Johnson go out there and out grapple his opponents like that? It's usually him on the bottom game. He was struggling with takedowns from guys of the likes of Jamie Malarkey and Clay Guida at his grown age. And you think I'm going to pick Darius Flowers because there is no chance on the feet he outstrikes him. Yeah, Evan Elder got dropped in the last fight. But the reason he got dropped in the last fight is because he doesn't move his head. But one thing this guy can do, which will be a problem for Flowers because of how much he leaves himself open, is that stiff jab. And he was landing out on Valdez a lot in that fight. So I'm going to go with an Evan Elder. But in a weird way, I can just see like Darius Flowers surviving because that's the type of guy he is. So I can see a decision for Evan Elder where he just puts on a clinic. I'm saying 30-27. I do not rate this Darius Flowers guy. I did entering the UFC. But now that I've seen him against guys like Michael Johnson getting held down, that will give Evan Elder a confidence boost. Like this guy, realistically, where was it? Here. The fight got stopped because of a cut. That's one of the most painful ways to lose. And he was growing into that fight, looking like he might actually win in that third round. But the cut stopped it. And then you have the Preston Parsons. That was just pure grappling, overwhelming. Darius Flowers could do that if he used his brain, but he doesn't. He goes out there, like I said before, looking to strike. And on the ground, if you can get him down, which I don't think Evan Elder, his main goal will be, he just lies there and doesn't know what to do and just accepts the position on the ground. So I'm going with an Evan Elder decision where he just outworks him on the feet and Darius Flowers somehow finds a way to just stay alive in the fight. Right, Montel Jackson versus Damon Blackshear. Blackshear is not a bad pick. I can actually see why people are going with him. But I am going to go with Montel Jackson. I know he's been out for a year, but I think people are forgetting how good this guy actually was. And I'm going to go with a decision. I think Damon Blackshear, he's going to be a hard guy to finish. Because what he does is he tries to get you close in the pocket. And he wants to grapple with you and start bringing you down. And when he brings you down... We saw that he got a twister. Do I think he can do that to Montel Jackson? No, of course not. Like, getting put in a twister is probably one of the most embarrassing submissions to be put in. It's like being put in, um, what was that thing called? The Boston Crab. You've probably seen it before. If you get put into one of those things, you should be cut from the UFC. I'm sorry, if you get put in a Boston Crab, I mean, not a twister. That's kind of embarrassing, but you don't deserve to get cut because of it. But if you ever get put in a Boston Crab, oh my god, never fight again. But anyways, Montel Jackson, his range management is very good. The only thing I would worry about, which I don't think Damon Blackshear will target, is throwing hooks. Because he usually measures the distance in the pocket, like grabbing onto the wrist of your opponent. And when you do that, if your opponent can slide one hand out of that like grip you've got, that hook is wide open and your chin's wide open to be caught. But then again, I don't really see Damon Blackshear as a guy with loads of knockouts. But you could arguably say he beat Mario Batista. And the Zalal fight, draw. Nothing wrong with that. But it was a competitive fight early. But the one fight that might concern you is the one here of Farid Basharat. But to me, it's not. He is like his brother. Extremely technical and mixes everything up. And he can just out-IQ you in a fight. And that's what he did there. Montel Jackson, for me, I think he's going to out-IQ Damon Blackshear. Plus, Blackshear has shown that he actually can get tired in fights. And if you get tired against a guy like Montel Jackson, he's just going to mess around with you because he can also grapple as well. But he doesn't always take people down. He might clinch with you against the cage and then look to throw strikes from that position. But predominantly, I think he's going to be on the feet looking to counter Damon Blackshear as he's coming into the pocket for takedowns. If free money was a thing, here it is. Joshua Van versus Charles Johnson. How the hell Joshua Van is only a slight favourite is very 
motivating. And I would do Joshua Van by decision. I think we've seen from Charles Johnson, he's a very hard guy to put away. And he's coming off a very good win against Jake Hadley, who looked like a good prospect. But his striking is very hit or miss. He's not a great striker. But when he comes up against a candle like Malcolm Gordon, he can put him away. But Joshua Van puts a stupidly high pace. If you thought Zalgaz Zalmagulov like, should have won that fight, which is a good take to make, Joshua Van will do double the tempo of him, plus he is quicker than Zalgas. And in my opinion, better than Zalgas. So I'm expecting a, I'm not even joking, a 30-27. And the reason I say that, not a 29-28, is because Van's not a guy for me who's a glass jaw. Yeah, he got dropped by Borges, but Borges hit kind of hard. Johnson don't really hit that hard. I know he's dropped people, but he's, to me, not a power puncher. He's a guy who's going to make it quite technical with his strike with that jab, but then make it to a decision. He does it all the time. His grappling isn't that great. He finds good ways of surviving, like his leg got chewed up by leg kicks, starts stomping his leg, doesn't give out. But then you look at the stupid loss. Like how do you lose to Oddie Osborne? Like, Oddie Osborne is nothing special. To me, he's very average. And he was getting out grappled by him. I wouldn't even be surprised. Van won't submit him, but we've seen, I believe he did it against Borgas later on, that he can bring people down and mix up a bit of grappling. Like, the only thing we haven't seen is jiu-jitsu, but I don't expect that from him. But I do expect him to destroy a guy like Charles Johnson in this fight. So for me, I'm going with a Joshua Van decision, 30-27. Johnson will not look as good as he's looked in his last two fights. He's an interesting fighter to have at flyweight, but he is nothing special. And the age as well, perfect pick for um, Joshua Van, very confident. Right, this one here, I had to have a small think about, because one... One of them has a glass jaw and gets knocked out going for a takedown without absorbing a punch going for a takedown. And the other one, he can be very inconsistent and decision making can be strange at times. So, who am I going to go with? I'm going with Andre Petrosky. And you know what? It's such a hard pick to do because I'm not very confident in it. But I'm going to go by submission because I'm thinking of the mindset. If you've just been knocked out twice, well, not knocked out, but TKO'd twice, and on the feet, your striking has looked poor, getting wobbled and rocked all over the place. You're trying to throw, like, jabs, and you're getting countered by a jab, and you're, like, backing into the fence, and you're going for a takedown, and you get knocked out. I think questions need to be answered. So, for me, I do think Josh Fremd can win this fight. Well, no, I don't. I think Andre Petrosky can win this fight by just shooting in and pretty much looking for that takedown. And then when he gets the takedown on a guy like Josh Fremd, I see him locking up a submission because one thing he's got is when he's on the ground, he's got good control and he's good at getting the submission. But it's all about he's going to have to work hard for it because Fremd isn't going to be an easy guy to just pick up. Like He looks big as well. And trying to take that guy down to the ground and like manhandle him, it's going to be hard, but I think eventually he will in the first round. And I don't think he's going to knock himself out this time. So I can just see Josh Schremd getting submitted in the first round by a quick rush of energy by Andre Petrosky. And I think he's going to arm triangle him. But if he stays on the feet for any longer than a round, he's getting finished. Right, Drew Dober versus Gene Silver. People are obsessed with calling it Chad Drew Dober, whatever you want to call him. And some people say that he just can't beat fighters like Gene Silver. You know what I'm on about. I've seen it trending all over the place, but that is not true. But anyways, I'm going with Drew Dober. I did pick Gene Silver to beat Charles Jordan, but this is a featherweight who has never fought a guy full of power. Drew Dober's fought these hard hitters before, and he also carries a lot of power himself. And one thing that he will do that the two last opponents of Gene Silver have not been able to do effectively, is stay in his face after absorbing punishment. I expect Gene Silver, if it lasts longer than a round, to win the first round. Because I think Drew Dober's going to eat a lot of punches with his face, and he'll resort to throwing leg kicks, 
and then trying to close the distance and eating even more punches, but he'll just survive in it. I know Matt Frivola caught him and dropped him, but do you want to know why that happened? That happened because he has got good footwork, so it allows him to put him in positions where he can move out the way and then land the shot and then drop you. Gene Silva, he hasn't got amazing footwork. He's just got a very good shot selection. So I expect Drew Derber to go out there, lose the first round, and then round two, pick up the tempo, and now Gene Silva's starting to struggle because he's used to fighting these featherweights who are fighting him at range compared to a guy who's pretty much going to be in your face at lightweight, carries more power than Gene Silva, in my opinion. Like, you know, look how many knockouts he's got at lightweight. The record, I believe. And he is going to knock him out. And I think he'll do it by hooks. I think he'll just start swinging hooks at Gene Silva's head. Not really much technique about it, but when you get pressed... But when you get pressed up against the cage, you're like how a guy like Drew Dober will do it, you will crumble. The amount of people who have crumbled to pressure, Terence McKinney, good start, crumbles. But I'm not going to compare him to him because he's a glass jaw. Gene Silver in. But I think this is a quite a big step up to make after the last fight, which is deserved. Short notice. Drew Dober has been in the camp, by the way. Gene Silver, fight ready because he just had a fight. But I do expect Drew Dober to go out there and land like a farrage of punches and get the finish. Right, Christian Rodriguez versus Julian Arosa. I'm going with Christian Rodriguez and I'm going to go with a KO round one. Julian Arosa is a technical fighter with good grappling, like technical grappling, an extremely good jiu-jitsu game, even defensively. Like you can shoot in on him and he can jump onto that guillotine, like Ricardo Ramos alone. That was a low IQ move by Ramos, by the way. But Rodriguez, he is very underrated. I don't think he gets enough credit. Like You don't really hear people bring up his name. He's known for beating Rul Rosa Jr. But his only loss is actually to Jonathan Pierce. And that was because, I believe, it was short notice. And he kept shooting in on him. He was land, land, like landing whilst they are in the um, wrestling transition range. But he just couldn't get anything going because of how like Colby-like Jonathan Pierce was. And I expect Christian Rodriguez to go against Julian Arosa and counter effectively, and then Julian is going to be shooting him for the takedown. It's not going to work. And then he's going to be forced to have to strike with him on the feet. And although I don't think Rodriguez is a power puncher, Arosa's chin is horrific. I wouldn't even be surprised if Amanda Nunes knocked him out. No, I'm joking. But I'm just saying that chin is on the levels with McKinney. As soon as you land one good strike, and how good Christian Rodriguez counters are, Arosa will walk into it and get knocked out. And that's why I'm predicting. I think he's going to counter hook him, like almost like a check hook. As Julian Arosa's coming into range and he'll get knocked out. Pretty much out cold, no TKO needed. Right, Cody Brundage versus Abdul Razak Al Hassan. This fight is very weird because on paper, Abdul Al Razak Al Hassan should knock him out in the first round. But why do I see in my head a Cody Brundage? finding a way like a Paul Craig he's not Paul Craig's level because he hasn't beaten anyone that level but he's somehow won some fights that he should never have won like how the hell did he beat Zach Cruz after watching what he did to Mark Wes and beat Jacob Malcolm but again I'm not counting that one because that was actually a disqualification so I'm not going to count that but one thing I've noticed with Abdul Razak Al Hassan when an opponent averages one or two takedowns on him he will tend to lose. If like a guy, like look at Joe Pfeiffer, for example, he can do everything pretty much, but he's not predominantly a wrestler. But when he uses it, Abdel Radek Al Hassan doesn't know what to do. And usually he's quite big in cage, like he's quite beefy and strong. He's not an easy guy you would think on paper to ragdoll. But Joe Pfeiffer did it. And why do I see in my head Cody Brandage going out there, taking him down and somehow winning? But then I go back and think to the Michelle Ali and Jacek. Yeah, it was that fight. So I do expect Abdul Razak Al Hassan to pretty much walk him down early, pin his back up against the cage. Then you're going to see Cody Brandage panic shooting. But one thing he does, it's very strange. He gives away takedowns. I can see him shooting for a takedown, eating one strike of Abdul Razak Al Hassan. And then he crumbles down to the ground, almost shelling up because he's eating a big strike. And now Razak's on top of him, even though he's not really a grappler. But he has improved in terms of getting a takedown. I believe he got one on Claudio Ribeiro. I, I might be wrong. 
but he's improved and I expect him to get that finish, ground and pound finish and Cody Brundage due to the fact he'll pull himself into a position where he'll get finished. Gabriel Bonfim versus Angel Usa. Oh my god. The amount of locks on this card. Free money. Gabriel Bonfim will submit Angel Usa with ease and he will do it in the first round. But my only concern, because you've always got to be concerned, because even though UFC fighters can win you money, they can also make some dumb, dumb decisions. Like, look at the biggest upsets we've had. For example, a guy like Mike Jackson winning without actually landing a knockout or a submission or even a, a decision, disqualification. Dumb things can happen. Like someone hits them on the back of the head, the guy acts like he's been shot, acts like an Aljamain Sterling, and then gets given the win, Cody Brundage. But apart from that, Gabriel Bonfim should submit Lucid. The only dangerous part is, how long does Bonfim keep it on the feet? Because I'm sorry, Angel Usa can put a high work rate out in the first round. Go back and look at that fight with Jack Della Maddalena. But then he can slow down in like rounds two and three. And that's the one thing I fear about him. So it's all about, can he deal with Bromfim early? If he can't, he ain't getting him out of there. Because Angel Usa, I repeat, will not win a decision. Borderline impossible. And eventually, Gabriel Bromfim's going to shoot in for the legs. As soon as he's shot in from the legs, it won't be a guillotine this time. I'm predicting he's going to go out there and arm triangle him. So I think this is going to be a no BS pretty much going straight for the takedown and he'll submit him and then Angel is pretty much done. Not from the UFC, but I'm saying in that fight, he's he's finished. He got a, what was it? No contest. I was about to say, he didn't give a draw. That Brian Batter where he acted all aggressive after the fight, all confident, but there was not that energy in the cage when they were fighting. But anyways, yeah. Right, here we have... Santiago, no, I got it confused. Ponzinibbio versus Muslim Salikov. I was about to say a bottler, but no. Santiago Ponzinibbio is not a bottler. He's been out for a long time. This is pretty much a pensioner fight. The fact that two 38-year-olds are going to be co-main eventing. Oh my God, I almost, I don't, I don't know what's going on with my throat, but this will be in an arena, I believe. Let me just check. Yes, it's in an arena. I can't believe this is the co-main event on the card. This is probably, again, another prelim fight. Not even a main card event. Santiago Ponzinibbio, he is washed now. Like, the chin of his... It's very hit or miss. He hasn't been finished in a while, apart from the Kevin Holland fight. I'm not talking about that, but previous to that. He wasn't really getting finished over and over and over again. But he's been inactive. Muslim Salikov, he's been semi-active. But he's looked bad in most of the fights. Like Muslim Salikov's last win was Fial Ho, And that was almost two years ago. And Fial Ho, to me, he is washed. That win has not aged well. So the last good win was probably Trinaldo, if I'm honest with you. Like he has fell off hard, Salikov. He weren't anything special, but when I tell you he's fell off bad, he has. So I expect Santiago Ponzinibbio to win. And I think Salikov will survive. I think it'll be a decision because the way how Santiago Ponzinibbio fights, very quick jab, in and out. He was getting cooked by Alex Morono and then the overhand right comes. So you know what? If you think he's going to knock him out, I think round three or early, no, yeah, round three or late round two. I don't think he's going to go out there in the first round and do it Randy Rounded. Randy Brown's range is very good. And then you look at the fight previously, Nicholas Stolby, he was just wearing him down. And I expect Ponzi Nibio to do something similar. Wearing him down. I think he might throw a lot of body shots. But I do not expect him to lose the fight. But that being said, the way this year has gone, Muslim Salikov decision, I would not be surprised about. But I don't think he'll knock him out. So yeah. Right, Rose Namajunas versus Tracy Cortez. I'm going with Rose Namajunas. And again... I think it's going to be a controversial decision. I don't see a knocking her out. But the thing about Tracy Cortez, very good ex, not, very good takedown defense. Rose Namajunas for me, takedowns are hit and miss. 
And another thing about her, when she goes for takedowns, no, like when she gets taken down, she can end up getting thrown on her head. Jessica Andrade's done it. Ribas threw her and she landed on her head. But to be fair to you, I had to go back and watch the fight because when I watched it live, I was falling asleep. It was so boring. And I expect Tracy Cortez is striking. Like, she looks like she has more of a pop in her punches now. Like, Rose Namajunas, you could argue she lost to Ribas. Her last few fights have not looked good. She's been getting outstriked. Carla Esparza, that was just embarrassing. I don't even want to talk about it. Close win where you could argue Jasmine Jadavika should have won that because she was applying pressure late on, but it just seemed like Cortez had more power in her stripes. And I can see that happening here. But I think where there'll be a change in the fighters from round three. Because in round three, what will happen is she'll be tired. Like, look how tired she looked in that fight with Jasmine. Rose Nami Yunus, I don't really fear about her getting tired. I fear about her just getting hit by hard strikes and being out point striked. I really do. Like, this isn't the Rose Nami Yunus who fought against Wei Li Zhang and knocked her out. It isn't. So, for me, I do think she's going to win it based on endurance, not skill. Because I think Tracy Cortez's technique recently is a lot better than Rose Nami Yunus. Like, her striking was good against Jasmine. Like, she weren't just throwing your stereotypical one to Darren Teal down the pipe. She was mixing up some hooks as well as some of the leg kicks. And I think if she can do some of that against Rose Nami Yunus, there'll be problems. But where the issues could come is, in women's MMA, not a lot of fighters have a lot of good head movement. And Rose Nami Yunus can throw high kicks. And Tracy Cortez ate, like, a couple of kicks against Jasmine. And I'm thinking, if that's Rose Nami Yunus, she has got power with her feet. But with her boxing, not really. So I do expect her. I know I'm saying a lot of things in favour of Cortez, but I think this is quite a big push already. I would have liked to see her fight someone maybe a little bit lower ranked than Nami Yunus, then maybe move on to her. But to be fair, she is 30 years of age. And I used to think she was younger than she actually is, but that's irrelevant. So, yeah. I'm going with Rose Nami Yunus. Thank you for watching. Talk to you soon.